the Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Yeah, you're welcome along. So, Sunday paper review. Joe Malloy with you on this Sunday morning. I'll run you through the back pages. First of all, the uh, Sunday Times, as you can imagine, like most of the papers, leading with events at Crow Park yesterday. So we have final reckoning. It's Tyrone here who beat Kerry an extra time to set up a final showdown with Mayo. A picture of Colin McShane on the front page of the Sunday Times who scored 1-3 off the bench and had a huge influence in proceedings. Uh, beneath that, the uh, Ronaldo story is everywhere as well. As you can imagine, uh, Glazers were told Ronaldo is football's Tom Brady. So it seemed this was a big part of the pitch from Ronaldo's people to those at Manchester United, the Glazers in particular. I guess a uh, frame they could understand, I suppose. Uh, Sunday Independent, again, it's uh, Crow Park yesterday. It's a picture this time of Conor McKenna and he's celebrating that amazing moment in extra time when Tyrone scored the third goal and they gave themselves a five-point lead. So Tyrone pass toughest test of all is the headline there uh, Dermot Crow's piece on the front page Tyrone produced a sensational 314 to 22 points extra time win over favourites Kerry and Crow Park yesterday in their twice deferred All-Ireland semi-final two goals from Conor McKenna won by Colin McShane inspired the Ulster champions who now face Mayo in the final on Saturday week uh, Sun Sport again they're going with Tyrone at the top Miracle Glow and uh, picture celebrations and then beneath that, it's Mikel Arteta, who's having a tough time right now. And it says, uh, look in the mirror, not at the table. Arteta takes blame for flops. Beaten 5-0 yesterday, Arsenal by Manchester City. So an ignominious start to their season, to say the least. Back page of the mirror then. They have Tyrone at the very top. Tyrone topple kingdom to seal final at Croker. And then beneath that um, photo from Anfield, Yesterday, I would suspect this is just after the uh, penalty was scored and it's Azpilicueta and Jordan Henderson clashing uh, fight clubs. Azpilicueta blasts the Reese James red card as angry blues cling on for a huge point. And for instance, they did cling on almost comfortably really in that uh, second half down to 10 men for 45 minutes. Mail on Sunday. So what do you think of us now, Tyrone? After weeks of disruption, delay, controversy and criticism, defiant Tyrone stunned Kerry to roar into final and the headline. So what do you think of us now? That was a comment by uh, Kieran McGeary, who was amazing yesterday. Brilliant performance from uh, the number six for Tyrone yesterday. And then uh, hands of honour again. It's Tyrone. A picture of uh, Niall Morgan, hands in the air. Tyrone, 314, Kerry, 22 points. And uh, also Tuchel not happy with ref. Again, that reference to events at Anfield. Very happy to say Gavin Comiskey of the Irish Times is with us, as is Conor McKeown of the Irish Independent. So, Conor, what do you think of them now? <laughs> um, well, something much different to what I did think of them yesterday. I, I, you know, I honestly didn't know what shape um, they were going to go into the game with. But they were very impressive insofar as, like, they got a few lucky breaks in the first half. There was... You know the goal that Stephen O'Brien should have scored for for Kerry, um, and it was a bad mistake on Kerry's part that they didn't score that. And and not long after that, Conor McKenna got a goal, and I have a suspicion Conor McKenna was about to come off because uh, he looked like he'd injured his shoulder, and then they got a second goal. But I suppose it was Tyrone's staying power, you know, to kind of sum it all up that was most impressive. And um, it was almost like they backed themselves utterly to absorb everything that Kerry threw at them, and. Whatever the circumstances about the two delays and the rights and the wrongs of that, in a very basic sporting sense, they have come back from a 16-point defeat in the space of 10 weeks to beat Kerry in an All-Ireland semi-final. And that alone, I think, is extraordinary. Uh, Roy Curtis here in the uh, Sunday World says, The reeling in the years field of the sporting week endured through an extraordinary contest. Cristiano Ronaldo back at Old Trafford, Tyrone's Wolverine hunger and blowtorch intensity ensuring dark memories were uh, rapping on the door of Kerry Mines. It was 2008 all over again. Gav, what did you make of it? Uh, I noticed that Connor couldn't couldn't bring himself to give a nine out of ten to a Tyrone player in the Sindo. But um, uh, yeah, it was it was it was first one of the first games in years I haven't been uh, at, and it was it was it just felt like watching old Tyrone, except they're physically bigger. Uh, they. They brought this unbelievable intensity. Cal McShane looked like an Aussie Rules player when he came on. Um, it, was, it was unbelievably impressive. That I'd say they they could have Mayo's number. Yeah, so Joe Brawley writing here in the Sunday Independent, he says, uh, for the first 60 minutes, it was an entertaining contest between Tyrone and David Clifford. 
But when Clifford got injured after a hospital pass from Sean O'Shea, Kerry were done. Trying to win an All-Ireland with a one-man team is a precarious business. Kerry, looking like an over-eager under-20 side, slightly out of their depth against the real thing, soloed into cul-de-sacs and hand-passed the ball away on multiple occasions. Had it not been for Clifford, Tyrone would have walloped them. What about that, Connor? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair assessment. At halftime, we were all saying in Grove Park that we're not for Clifford. Kerry would be in serious bother. And, um, you know, like not only, like his finishing is extraordinary, really, because he can kind of bend the shot off. I mean, like, he must be an absolute nightmare to mark. But besides that, he was actually winning ball out in front of Ronald McInerney. Um But the amazing thing that Tyrone did um, was... They have good individual defenders, but but the, the pressure that they put on the ball coming out the pitch and also how they bottled up Kerry. Like Kerry made really, really poor decisions yesterday. And it's the third year in a row that they have lost, been knocked out of the championship. And will look back on the game and realize to their horror that a lot of their wounds were self-inflicted, that they made very, very poor decisions at key moments in games. Um, you know, they ran the ball down Tyrone's throats when there was absolutely no need. They were very fidgety in possession. They were trying to take quick freeze um, to try and get goal chances when they needed to actually take the sting out of the game and let Sean O'Shea kick his free. Like Sean O'Shea, only for Dean Rock has been around for the last 10 years. Um, you know, Sean O'Shea is the most reliable and metronomic free kick taker I think we've nearly ever seen. But when Tyrone... There, there's just something a bit too fidgety about Kerry and a bit like in 2019 in the drawn all Ireland final when they needed to slow the game down when Dublin had 14 men and Kerry were a point ahead in injury time and they were turned over and exactly like last year when they were ahead and taking pot shots against Cork down in Parky Cave they were guilty of the same sort of over eagerness like, like you know we praised Dublin so much over the last four or five years for their ability to actually take the sting out of the game and keep possession and set up the attack and get the crucial score. And Kerry, for all their kind of attacking riches, and they do have an awful lot of players. I understand what Broly says about Clifford, but you know, you have to direct the ball through Clifford. He's so good. But they have a lot of good attackers. They have an awful lot of pace and defence. What they have in the three years of Peter Keane's reign as Kerry manager lack that ability to actually manage the game mm. and it played totally into Tyrone's hands yesterday and that's at least 50% of the reason they lost Brawley goes on to say so you mentioned Sean O'Shea there Brawley says as always took his freeze beautifully but he's not at the highest level of Gaelic football forwards rather he's an artist from place balls and given time can kick points beautifully from play however he's not a top line goal scorer nor does he have the pace or craft to open up a defence like Tyrone's. Here he got one point from play and he goes on to say as well that like his other four forward colleagues, he was nervy and anonymous. Tyrone Camley swatting them aside and uh, he finishes up by saying this Tyrone team are a tight, happy group. They love Doher and Logan. They're tough, ruthless and full of football. Like Millwall, no one likes them and they don't give a damn. At the final whistle, all that remained was for Pat Spillane to go and have a good puke and... Uh, Mark O'Shea kind of echoes your points as well. He's writing here on page 76 of the Mail. He says, uh, ultimately not enough of uh, the Kerry leaders showed up in Croke Park yesterday. It means it's going to be another long winter in the kingdom. Mentions Kieran McGeary has been everywhere, covered every blade of grass and picks out an another few Tyrone players. He says um, as well, so uh, Peter Hart's heroic block and Killian Splan, that one where he took studs into the ribs, uh, for his troubles. He says Spillane's effort was an example of Kerry's poor decision making yesterday. They were constantly taking the wrong option, writes Mark O'Shea here. Spillane just needed to fist the ball over the bar at that stage and keep the scoreboard ticking over. And then he goes on to even say um, it afflicted Kerry players, their poor decision making that is. It afflicted Kerry players for the whole game right up to the final moment when Tommy Walsh rushed his final kick. Walsh has been a wonderful servant for Kerry down the years but he made the wrong choice there. What he needed to do in that instance was rotate the ball out until they found someone in a better position. They had time because David Coldrick uh, would have allowed it back after the uh, black card. So decision making being picked out by quite a few here, Gav, across the Sunday papers really. A lot of cul-de-sacs uh, ran into yesterday. I, th I think just uh, Paulie Clifford's a great player obviously but I just thought the way he was on the ball so much wasn't a coincidence. The way he was 
especially after his brother went off, the way he was constantly on the ball seemed to be what Tyrone wanted. As in, they he'd go and he'd drive into them and they'd, they'd, they'd have him cornered off and they they had him down by the end line a few times as well. But I thought I thought actually the best quotes on the game were um, Niall Morgan's with Malachy Clerken in Saturday's paper. Um, I thought that was fascinating what he said and his his description of his defence basically of the team and how they came in because obviously the jokes were flying in the second extra time when Tyrone were going to another level fitness wise and physically you know after uh, being de- decimated but I think a lot of what Nod Morgan said about how he basically accused uh, the fact that they're in stadiums for two and a half hours in dressing rooms for two and a half hours for three major games in Crow Park this year for that's probably more of a reason for why COVID broke out in their camp than them partying with their partners after the Ulster final. Um, I thought the most interesting thing about that was the whole backroom team celebrated in the dressing room. So, like, he, he made it very clear that, that that's probably where um, probably where COVID broke out in the in the camp, as opposed to them having beers half the panel having beers after the final. He he made a really really robust defence of them, and obviously there's been a lot of whispers going around and nothing. Mm. Uh, I, I, I still think I think the GA might have to respond to this to what Noel Morgan's comments are in Saturday's Irish songs because um, they need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Like they need to make sure it doesn't happen in the next few weeks. Never mind the next year. Um, so it's kind of a case of track and trace and finding out who patient one is and finding out how this happened. I think I think that needs to happen and hiding behind medical um, uh, personal medical advice uh, is not going to. It doesn't have to go into the public domain, but it definitely needs to have to go into every panel needs to know what happened to avoid it in the future. Well, that was a big part of the pre-match discussion as well on RTE, Pat Spillane and Sean Cassidy. It's a huge argument, yeah. Yeah, so Spillane, I was curious to say, uh, to see what, he'd, where, what direction he'd go in today. Page 68 of the uh, Sunday World. And uh, so the headline is Tyrone's Ambush Suckers Kingdom. And then the byline is, I have to say, Red Hands pulled a bit of a stroke around the COVID business. So he uh, talks about the match initially for the first half is peace and uh, I mean in, in some ways he makes a fair point like he says this game was difficult to analyse at least rationally you know Kerry the team who were scoring goals for free this year they hit Tyrone for six in the league I know we can discount that but they did hit uh, Tyrone for six in the league he says uh, meanwhile Tyrone had managed one goal in the Ulster series but they hit three against Kerry while the Munster champions failed to raise a single uh, green flag and he says secondly Kerry dismantled Tyrone's kick out strategy they pressed up and Morgan's restarts forced him to go long, but Kerry dominated here for uh, the most part, and yet they still lost. Again, it defied logic. Um, and, there, you know, there is a bit of that. Like, there were moments where it did feel like the goals were keeping Tyrone going. Like, I was kind of surprised at half time when they were saying Tyrone were definitely the be- better side. And I, did, I didn't have that sense right the way through that Tyrone were absolutely the best side, even though that was, like, the verdict from the panel and on RTE. And even at full time... Like with two minutes of normal time to go and look, it turned out there were nine minutes to go. So it wasn't quite two minutes of normal time. But you forget that like Kerry popped over um, another point to go two points clear in the 68th minute, you know, and Tyrone sucker punched them with a goal. Like I did feel, Connor, like those goals, each time they arrive for Tyrone, perfect timing. Like the to go one five to five points up was a lovely little fill up after the opening exchanges, obviously the third goal at the start of extra time an absolute sucker blow they kind of retreated and said right well we'll live off that um, I don't know whether they as clear winners are that much better than Kerry as maybe was being suggested on the panel you probably didn't see a lot of that because you were in the stadium but you might have a read on it being at the game yeah like I would agree with your assessment Joe um, it did feel like you know again it's like sliding doors Bowman had Paul Ganey put the ball in the net or had Stephen O'Brien managed to stay out of the square and Kerry had got that goal, you know, I, I would find it hard to see Tyrone turning that around, but they did, as you say, get the goals at the right time. Even the manner of the second goal, Jack Barry keeping the ball in oh. and getting get his foot and it falls directly to Conor McKenna. And I was sitting beside somebody and I said, we were having a conversation at that moment as to why Conor McKenna was still on the pitch because he'd been beaten to two balls and he was holding his shoulder and then he pops up with that second goal. So I think Tyrone, I wouldn't say that they got lucky because they kept positive and they kept trying to do the things. Mm. You know, they were there was definitely they were definitely underpinned by a kind of a collective belief that they were going to get at Kerry, that they were going to keep going and that they were going to get some sort of material reward out of it. But again, and I don't want to just be too down on Kerry because obviously, you know, it's a huge achievement for Tyrone to make another All-Ireland final. But 
Tyrone had two players black carded in the second half and Kerry got nothing off it. Like they may as well have had the same number of players on the pitch. Mm. And given the way the game is played now with the, you know, the, the value that's put on, on, on possession um, and the kind of matchups that are around the pitch, having an extra man is, 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 is invaluable. And the fact that Kerry could not do the sort of damage that they needed to do with an extra player on the pitch is another sort of damning thing because Mark O'Shea or whoever, sorry that you quoted there, that analysis about the kickouts, it's totally right. Like all um all Tyrone did was push up on the cornerbacks um and they forced Shane Ryan to kick to his mid-range uh, targets. But the Kerry won nearly every single one of them. Yeah. And when Niall Morgan had to go along, invariably, at least up until midway through the second half, Kerry won a high percentage. Now I haven't seen the precise stats, but on possession alone and having, you know, an extra man for 20 of the 70 minutes. Uh, Kerry should absolutely have won that game and that would have been my feeling but I think conversely then when we got the extra time you know like <laughs> Toronto did their damage and then went in on themselves mm. um, and they looked like to be a completely different team Yeah well Pat's plan in fairness to him does then go on to say you know Kerry waited around to make it happen Tyrone made it happen says they got all the matchups right really they won all the individual battles really bar Clifford against uh, Ronan McNamee says Colin McShane got 1-3 Kerry only uh, managed a point off the bench that was Jeremy O'Connor on the uh, Covid point though Gav sorry you brought that up he says uh, of the whole uh, situation uh, Tyrone lobbed a grenade into the laps of the GA and Kerry two weeks ago when they said they wouldn't be able to field a team the uh, GA and Kerry blinked Tyrone got their way there ought to be a module in business management schools on their tactics and negotiation skills. There wasn't even a hint of any of the Tyrone players yesterday being impacted in the slightest by COVID. So there are only two possible ex- explanations for what unfolded. Either the Tyrone squad have defied medical science and are able to run better and faster after getting over the virus, or the COVID situation was not as bad as they made it out to be. Are they the only two explanations, Gov? No. Um of course they're not. Um, and what I found quite interesting was after reading Al Morgan's interview with Malachy, which uh, is very interesting, Sean Cavanagh had the same defence when they were shouting at each other um, before the game with Spillane. Sean Cavanagh brought up the changing room thing. He goes, if you're stuck in a changing room on a roast, I think they both used the same word, roasting hot days. If you're stuck in a changing room for two and a half hours. That's how it happens. And um, it... Uh, I, I don't see any reason why not to take them at face value. Obviously, yeah. not a lot of aren't. Um, but it, it just has to be investigated. It has to be investigated properly. Again, it doesn't have to come into the public domain, but the GAA have to be able to come out and say, mm. we did this right down. We've spoke to every single medical person. We found patient one. We found out how it got in, and it's not through partying. And it's they also need to come out and defend. Like It's a really serious accusation that's been leveled at them that the changing room system is not correct. And like Crow Park need to come out and go, no, they have to defend us. They have to defend that and say, no, no, we've taken all precautions and we're super careful. Another thing what I found interesting after the match was the Kerry players stayed on the pitch for a very long time and you could see their, you could see their emotion on their faces and it was someone who were so surprised that they lost and there was anger and everything. You could mm. see it on the And I presume that was because once they go into the changing room, they're on a, they're on a countdown clock to get on the bus to get out of there. I that's what I presumed was the way because that's what it is in most sports so staying on the pitch was their only place to kind of breathe almost because there's no showers I think in the changing room so um, it's a it, that has to be looked at mm. the whole Tyrone thing has to be looked at has to be broke, broke down in detail and has to be studied and has to be learned from because otherwise it'll definitely happen again Well it came up just to uh, finish on this match then page 79 of the Mail on Sunday Michael Clifford here it came up in the post-match press conference. I suppose there are two aspects to what happened in the Tyrone camp. One, there's the outbreak and look, I get the dressing room explanation. I can see how that would happen. And then secondly, Fergal Logan's comments to Brian, uh, to uh, Declan Bogue in the Irish Examiner where he he seemed, I read it as a certain hesitancy on, on management and players part about the vaccine in case it might affect their performance and training for a week or two back in May. Um, And so a number of the players uh, weren't vaccinated. They gave them free choice. But if that was the rationale, maybe questions might be asked there about the the wisdom of that. But so it came up. um, Michael Clifford writes here on the first point, which is about just the outbreak. uh, Brian Dewar, he bristled, writes Michael Clifford at the line of questioning at the post-match press conference, interjected when his management partner, Fergal Logan, was quizzed about a comment he had made in the build-up, which intimated a number of the players had declined to be vaccinated. 
So here's Duher talking afterwards in the press conference. Can I say something here? If this is coming at us to attack us here, which seems to be heading that direction, I'm not here. We made a decision based on medical advice. The decision here he's talking about is not to play the match a couple of weeks back. We made a decision based on medical advice relevant to what happened and where we were and we took the medical advice. We weren't fit to field and we were told that. So I have a duty of care to those players next door to me. People mightn't think that, but that people mightn't think that, but was I going to put them out and something happened and fair enough, I said, no, I'm not. I would take the hit. And we were getting hassle from the players for doing that. They weren't happy. I pulled their championship on them. I don't want to get into this here now, but there's been a kind of slant here that we've tried to pull a fast one. It was a factual thing based on evidence. I don't want to get into this here, but if that's the way this is going, which it seems to be listening to it, I'm in the wrong place, said Duher, who left the press conference after making those comments. So uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Logan clarified his comments made to uh, Declan Bogue either, but um, no, but look, that's I where think we are. Just, there's probably, like, as you said, there's probably two elements to it. The first is to what extent would Tyrone have been able to play the game last week? So, you know, is that worries over the length of preparation time? Would they like would the same fifteen players have been in a physical state to start last week after the initial postponement by a week? You know, we don't know that, and presumably the GAA have been fed some information on that. And the Tyrone management um, were very stoic on that yesterday, um, because I suppose the implication it wasn't, wasn't exactly a, a cloaked or a disguised implication, particularly by Pat Spillane, was that Tyrone had pulled a stroke. You know, like you know, like a team who had suffered a couple of injuries that were going to clear up in a couple of weeks, they had effectively um, sought an extra week and said that you know we can't field a team. You know, we'd have to bring up a load of guys from the club to field this match, and it would be no use to anybody. So that's one aspect of it. The second one is about the vaccinations, and um, I know that we've a piece we probably cover from Martin Zeter in yeah, the we'll, Sunday we'll, Times. We'll go to that the, next. Yeah, we'll go to yeah, that and next. The, on the Premier League. Um, where all but three Premier League teams have declined to reveal the vaccination rates um, among their squad. You know, like, without getting too kind of, you know, uh, into the kind of ether of, of current events, yeah, like, vaccination is absolutely uh, a personal choice. But in a situation where people decline to be vaccinated and on foot of that, and I'm not saying this is definitely the case with Tyrone, yeah. but on foot of that, if... You know, you, you know, you can't fill the team. Players can't play. They contract COVID, and they end up uh, missing out. Like, who is the responsibility on there? Like, do the do the opposition or do the organising uh, the 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 sporting organised organising body then have to kind of take the hit and reorganise everything on the basis um, that people who would have been um, fit to play had they taken the vaccine didn't take the vaccine. But again. Like we're in a grey area because, mm. and I suppose this was the noble Pat Spillane's point because you know, uh, even though we were in the press box yesterday, we were all kind of chuckling away on our phones when we when we got fed the the row that they had with Sean Kavanagh. His point was very simply um, that we don't have the information, and then in a situation where there's so many people affected, it would certainly be helpful to bring everybody on board. Mm. It, was, uh, it was lively for the first time in a while that RTE panel I would have said there was a the moment where um, Pat Spillane was speaking over pictures and he turned to Kevin and said uh, don't shake your head at me Sean it was reminiscent of don't touch my knee a couple of years ago uh, they were shouting a bit too much over each other weren't they Joe like I just probably did a bit you. yeah yeah probably a touch yeah. but I mean I wasn't looking away either you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be po faced here and say oh no I just want in-depth analysis about the match I mean a good row from time to time is no bad thing either I suppose Kieran um, Whelan's face yeah. was brilliant. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. He just said nothing for about six minutes. The easiest fee minutes. of Kieran Whelan's life. He's like, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm here to watch the game. Um, but you know, we, we're in a grey area. We're yeah. in a grey area that we're not getting out of anytime soon, Joe. Like Stephen Kenny was, um, before he announced his squad this week, Stephen Kenny, I was actually about to write that he finally actually has decisions. He can make he can make decisions about who he plays in midfield and who he plays up front. And as it was, it was the night before, and as I was writing it, uh, Callum Robinson came out yeah. with COVID. Alan Brown was ruled out as a, from Preston's team as a close contact. And so obviously that was what was put to Kenny. And Kenny had to be really careful not to be highly critical of his team by saying, yes, they should all get vaccinated. But yes, there's a, there is, he, he came out and said, yes, there is a culture, which we've heard about in English football yeah. at the moment, where players, and I think Ziegler touches on it, they're kind of influenced by WhatsApp groups over actual medical science. And there is a culture of not get, of being anti-vaccine. 
vaccine amongst professional athletes, yeah. especially professional footballers. And I'm not saying Callum Robinson or Alan Brown are in that bracket, but they're in championship and um, they're in Premier. They're in teams over in England that have a lot of people who are not willing to get vaccinated well, for reasons. This uh, culture at the moment, I suppose, if for want of a better word, in English football is laid out in two places. So page 17, Martin Ziegler, I think this is, a, this is a really interesting piece. So COVID code of silence leads to sport versus the vaccine. So it's basically he's been trying to get a sense of what's going on over in English football. He says it's the COVID code of silence. He says all bar three Premier League clubs have refused to give details about just how many of their players have been vaccinated against coronavirus. By the way, I get that. I think everybody's entitled to their medical privacy. So I don't think I need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. But all bar three have uh, declined on medical privacy grounds. But Leeds United, Wolves and Brentford have uh, gone public. They've gone public with the vaccination rates at any rate anyway. So um, between 89% and 100% of the players in those three squads have been jabbed. The other 17 Premier League clubs have all cited confidentiality. So Ziegler writes, what's emerged from speaking to club officials across the Premier League is that the picture varies considerably. Players at some clubs are far more reluctant than others to be jabbed. In some cases, influenced by the messages from players in official or unofficial leadership positions at the club. So the piece goes on to say of one club, for instance, uh, one club is a Premier League club. One club insider said there had been issues around players sharing anti-vax propaganda on their WhatsApp groups. Some have shared posts from the former Southampton player Matt Letizia. I mean, I didn't know Matt Letizia was a part of this story, but lo and behold, some uh, have shared posts from Matt Letizia who had argued on social media that the vaccine has not been properly tested. He also claimed, this is Letizia, without evidence, says Ziegler, that there had been 15,000 vaccine-related deaths in Europe alone. The insider went on to say, players often spend too much time on their WhatsApp groups or social media, so the anti-vax material can be an issue. Some players were also worried that they may lose their place in the team if there are some side effects and they don't want to take that risk. Goes on to a touch on Neil Warnock publicly, the Middlesbrough manager who said uh, the club is trying to persuade the players to have vaccinations, but the majority, he said, of players haven't had it. I've no idea why. Obviously, it's a personal choice. Uh, Newcastle, Steve Bruce, you know, they've had a serious outbreak there and the goalkeeper seemed to lose a ton of weight and suffer really badly, Carl Darlow. So they've spent time really trying to get their players to take the vaccine. They're planning Newcastle two pop-up vaccinations for the training ground and it's thought that more than half of the first squad has now had the first jab. So they're making some progress there. Uh, the PFA has made it clear to clubs that um, they support vaccination efforts but they uh, won't agree to any moves to make it mandatory, which I think is probably fair enough. I think mandatory is getting uh, going too far. Um, the hope Ziegler uh, outlines is that maybe the World Cup qualifiers might um, prompt a few to get the vaccines because it's going to make travel abroad much more difficult without the double jab. And so um, pragmatism might kick in there. But yeah, there seems to be here, uh, Gav, as you're saying, a real culture of anti-vax messages and like one or two leaders in the dressing room start, you know, send, sharing that Facebook post that their uncle sent them about, did you see this? And it seems Matt Letizia is uh, in the midst of it here as well and, and, and getting through to some of the players and uh, a bunch of them are saying, OK, I'm taking no chances, not for me. And a bit of groupthink is setting in, it would seem. I got to, um, that obviously drew me straight to Matt Letizia's Matt Letizia Twitter. Same. And it's bit of crazy town going on there with a few of his tweets. Uh, it's He's definitely milita militant about the whole thing, mm. um, which is interesting. Um, Neil Warnock is the, is another one. Like Neil Warnock's well into his 70s, you know? And like, this is the other thing is you're putting risk at people, uh, like backroom staff who are in the danger zone if they get it, you know? Uh, players are doing that. The other thing is you want to go to Portugal and you're not taking it, which is your right. And you're a professional, you're an Irish international football player. You, you go, you've got to get two tests and if you don't have your back certs to travel. Everyone else, media, backroom, everyone has to have certs because it's their employers have insisted. So um, they're out there on their own. But what's clear is, what's apparent is, it's um, um, it's going to have a huge effect on Kenny. It already has had a massive effect on Stephen Kenny being able to do his job properly and being able to have success in the job. And um, it looks like it's going to visit him again this, in September. But it already has. With Callum Robinson and Mike, on Tuesday, I think, or tomorrow, Callum Robinson is 10 days clear. So if he gets a negative, he can link up with the squad in Dublin. They're staying near the Aviva Stadium for the Azerbaijan and Serbia games. Alan Brown's actually injured. But the thing is about Kenny, Kenny like was like, I definitely would have played Brown. 
So um, it's had, it been him, Alan Brown being a close contact, just has had a, has had an impact on how Ireland are gonna yeah. summon live to Stadio Al Algarve, you know. Ian Herbert in the Mail on Sunday comes out all guns blazing. Um, if players won't take the vaccine, drop them. So this is a, an opinion piece, but um, he talks here. You know the myth still going around football clubs for a long time was that Christian Eriksen had collapsed because he had the COVID vaccine. Which is, you know, so worrying when, like, Eriksen himself, Inter Milan have all come out to say he wasn't even vaccinated. Like, it had nothing to do with his situation. He writes here, Ian Herbert, Everton's Fabian Delph provided a glimpse into that, that world when he posted on Instagram uh, a quote from Healing Chamber, a holistic medical practitioner from North Carolina, who said, it's now a conspiracy theory to believe that the immune system is capable of doing the job it was designed to do, said the Post. So Ian Herbert got in touch with Dow's people. He says, needless to say, the shutters went down as soon as inquiries, inquiries were made. Neither the player's club nor agent would comment. The Post was hastily deleted. That's how it is at the top of the game. There are vastly uh, more people employed to shape and burnish the image of players than actually to write objectively and critically about them. They're untouchable. He says, uh, the top clubs have entire player liaison departments to do everything from changing their light bulbs to advising them on which sports cars to buy, not to mention armies of medical staff. Only in exceptional reasons, such as strong religious belief, should provide the remotest justification for uh, refusal. He says, it's unfashionable to suggest that vaccination should be mandatory. The counter-argument about the individual's right to choose comes back swiftly. Well, society transcends the individual at times like this. A beleaguered NHS uh, HS staff uh, desperate for the vaccination message to strike home matters more. Uh, Danny Murphy's quoted here. He says, uh, Danny Murphy reckons, you feel the majority have either fallen for the conspiracy theories or simply feel at their age that they're invincible. So that's... I'd say it's a, yeah. 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 I, I really would. I'd say, it's, I'd say it's... There is an attitude going, well, if I get COVID, it'll just go through me. And my, 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 my little circle of family is so small that it, I'll be fine. And But the others is there is certain elements of society are susceptible to conspiracy theories. And it, it it's increasingly apparent that uh, millionaires who play professional sports come into that bracket. Yeah. I was also saying during the week, I would think to some extent or other as well, Connor, like when you think about their experience of COVID, I mean, they were back playing football pretty early. They were going about mm. their, you know, the vast majority of their daily life, which was going to training, coming home, chilling out, you know, um, looking for their next car to buy. I guess they couldn't go out and eat in restaurants as much. But, you know, a huge percentage of their life remained entirely normal. And football continued even at the height of COVID. So I would think they're saying to themselves, well, I'm not going to risk taking a vaccine because, like, it's on the way in anyway now, COVID. And even at the height of it, I didn't have to really change my behaviour all that much. So I can sort of see how they might be a touch more immune to like the harsh realities of the pandemic than most of us whose lives were upended massively. Probably. The only thing is I remember seeing not long after Premier League clubs or, or sort of full professional sport went back, seeing uh, videos, you know, people getting tests before training. True, true. There's, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing to, to, to hammer home the message that the world is not quite as as it used to be. Then somebody jamming one of those things up your nose, yeah. you know, every day that you show up to train. And so that's a good point. Does it? Does it? You know, I I I think. Look, I mean, I don't know how long you could talk about the the, the pitfalls of social media, but you know, there is definitely an element of um, people now existing inside their own echo chamber now. Like they follow the people, they read the stuff that chimes with the things that they believe, and I think it's pretty easy to fall into you know, down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, regardless of what it is. And in a more general societal point, people are just so pissed off with how things have gone for the last two years. They want to take it out on somebody. You know, you have people in Dublin city centre, you know, protesting, and they're not exactly sure what they're protesting against, but they're protesting against something. And that big building over there, whatever it represents, that's what they're going to take out their anger on. And they're going to start roaring and shouting at everybody they see. And somehow they think that the COVID vaccine is representative of what the authorities are trying to make them do. And that's kind of, I think, at the nub of all of this, is that people are kind of just pissed off and they see the vaccine as being somehow... Uh, actually, I don't know what they see. Like, like, like what it is, the nub of what people believe. But the point about the more the more it becomes a societal issue as opposed to, you know, uh, a, a personal medical choice, 
obviously the hard like if you're a Premier League footballer and you know presumably you're able to follow you're able to go on a pretty good holiday when it comes around to the summer and if your travel is being restricted um, or you have to jump through a greater number of hoops to go on holiday for three weeks after the end of the season I'd say you're going to get the vaccine fairly quick so we might just be in a very kind of twilighty zone between mm. you know the thing being coming completely normalized and the last remnants of the kind of uh, the conspiracy theorists I don't think that was a protest. I think that was just Parliament Street's being pedestrianised. People knocking around, yeah. Um, Ian Herbert, by the way, says, the I hadn't realised this, the NFL have made it very clear they want to make vaccines for players compulsory. So we'll see how that goes. I'm sure there'll be a legal objection to that somewhere. The NFL, there. I'm not sure about the NFL, but I know the NBA, when they were bringing them into that first bubble last mm -hmm. year, uh, turned around and said, we're not going to test, we're not going to drug test for recreational drugs. Um, so don't worry about them. Just get into this bubble here and we'll get this season finished. And then they make, yeah, then there's financial incentives for them to get vaccinated. Mm. Uh, so let's uh, breeze through a few stories relatively quickly then. Um, Ronaldo's kind of everywhere. It feels remiss it was not to just briefly mention uh, Ronaldo, like Paul McGrath. Ronaldo means trophies for Man United is McGrath's take on the thing, whereas somebody like Jonathan Wilson in The Observer and also in The Sunday Independent thinks this is pretty much just uh, like uh, an embarrassing kind of tilt at nostalgia and uh, not very clear thinking on United's part. I don't know what page it's on here, but uh, he basically is making the point that Ronaldo is um, not going to suit the style of play. It's going to hold them back tactically. It's going to cost them a bunch of money, which it is. I hadn't realised he's getting well over half a million. So he's, he's getting uh, 500 and what is a thousand a week? I have it here now. He's the highest paid Premier League player. Yeah, 560,000 sterling a week, Ronaldo. And I hadn't realised Rafael Varane had gone in as the Premier League's uh, top earner on 400,000 sterling a week. So United's is wage bill is off the charts. Sorry, sorry, Joe, the point that I thought that Jonathan Wilson made really interestingly there in that piece, I think it's it's in The Observer, but it's in, in mm. page 11 of this on The Independence, yeah. um, is that like Ronaldo went to um, Juventus for whatever it was, 100 million as a as a 33 year old on the basic salary of 26.6 million a year. And he says it's a deal that must rank now as one of the worst in history mm. because while he scored 81 league goals in three seasons, you know, and, and therefore the illusion of Ronaldo was, you know, doing exactly what he's supposed to do. Um, they had two, uh, the three awful champions, like he was effectively there to win them the Champions League and yeah. given his strike rate in the Champions League, you know, that checked out, that makes sense. But they lost to Ajax, Leon, and Porto, uh, won in, won the first in the quarterfinal, two in the last 16. And, okay, well, they won seven Scudetti. They won seven Scudetti in a row before Ronaldo signed, and they won two more after he joined. Last year, they finished fourth, which is sort of unprecedented, you know, levels for Juventus. So, you know, th there's, obviously more to, <laughs> there's obviously more to this game. Like, I, I remember listening to Jonathan Wilson talk about how Paris Saint-Germain were going to organise the team now with Messi and Neymar. And effectively, he was saying is, you know, you now have a nine-man defence. You know, you have two guys who aren't going to contribute to it. Yeah. And and I think by the same token, like Ronaldo is literally the guy who's going to stand outside the box and sort of, you know, demand the ball, take all the free kicks and give out to the full-backs when they don't cross to him. Mm. Um, and it does, when you outline it like that, seem quite the outlay for somebody who's going to make you rework your entire team. Yeah. Wrong man, wrong time is uh, the headline there. He says, uh, welcome to United Land with an array of nostalgic installations and familiar faces. There's something for everyone. He says, gop at the score of the winning goal from the 99 Champions League in his very own technical area. Gaze on the goal score from the OA Champions League final grazing just outside the penalty area. Even the roof has a retro feel. He says, uh, what next? Will we have Martin Edwards back in the boardroom? Gary Bailey between the nets. Um, he says, of course, there's an appeal to bring back a former great, even one who seemingly uh, was perfectly happy to join their rivals. But he does say that it's just a bad idea. He says Ronaldo was even unsuited to Man City. You know, his uh, immobility, his reluctance to press held Juve back. He says uh, United's need for a central midfielder to link the two halves of the field is the priority. They held back and signing Declan Rice for money and now suddenly they've Ronaldo and all this money and Mason Greenwood suddenly, who'd started so well, has another obstacle for in front of him when it comes to first-team football. So he finishes by saying, uh, this is a whimsical signing. 
It fits the pattern of short-term crowd-pleasing that has characterised much of the eight years since Ferguson retired. Nothing has been learned. United look doomed to drift on amid the shadows of their past greatness. What about Ronaldo then, Gav? Well, um, I actually find it, uh, there's obviously lots in the papers on him today. Um, Rebecca Meyer's piece in the Sunday Times oh, jumped yeah. out. Yeah. It's in the Irish version. Um, I was looking at it online. Uh, he's still being sued for 56 million in America. Um, so I know you, one of the best line out of it was Juventus had to cancel a summer tour in 2019 because there was still potential criminal proceedings against him for an incident in Las Vegas with a lady called <clears throat> Catherine Mayorga in 2009. Um, and at the moment, a Nevada judge is trying to rule um, if she was mentally stable when she signed a confidentiality deal back then that was only worth 300,000. Yeah, she claims she wasn't at the time men in, in the yeah. correct mental state to sign that NDA. So there's a massive legal issue uh, hanging over Cristiano Ronaldo and he's just been signed by an um, American owners who will probably want to do all their summer. Like, uh, Ronaldo was poised to break into the American market in a major way 10 years ago and it didn't happen. Or, and I think this had a lot... The Der Spiegel story had a big impact on it, I think, in 2018. Um, so that won't go away until that case is settled. Mm. And I imagine it will be settled as opposed to go to court. Do you suspect um, he'll be asked about that in the English press, Gav? I don't think they'll be asking him about it, but I think they'll be writing about it. Well, it's because it's, the first thing that came to my head was when it happened, uh, when, when the whole thing came through, was I wonder if they'll do it. And Rebecca Myers has sat down and wrote uh, just a very informative piece. I thought that Juve line was fascinating. Um, so it's one thing you're guaranteed is that whatever's going on in your life will be reported by when you come back into the English media. So he'll be exposed to that again um, as much as as much as they can. Like if the Sunday Times have had a go at it, I'm sure that they're not the last people to write about it. Um, it's a very interesting case and it's very interesting to see how it plays out. 56 million um, is, a, is, a, is a massive story, obviously. Yes, Ronaldo strongly denies the accusations. Uh, Myers writes calling them fake news and claiming that the uh, sex was consensual. In 2018, his lawyer said the document was completely fabricated and he threatened to sue the German publication i'm not sure that has happened uh, der spiegel so i don't think it did happen no no so yeah no. Uh, legal battles continue over rape claim is the headline in the uh, sunday times there that's rebecca myers on page 12 uh, there are a few pieces on portugal ireland uh, philip quinn paul rowan uh, tommy conlon i wouldn't uh, say optimism is in the air gav to be honest it's a fairly no i, fairly I, da I downtrodden I, preview I, well, Tommy Conlon certainly um, really didn't spare him at all. Um, he didn't spare the players. Uh, I'll read a quick line from him. Yeah. He was like exasperated by the fact that James McCarthy came up in questioning. But James McCarthy comes up in questioning every time Stephen Kenny sits down, even. And Kenny ended it pretty quickly by saying, he's played 15 minutes for Celtic, he's not fit. So, no, maybe October. Uh, but uh, Tommy writes, uh, a place, James McCarthy, a player uh, who was the definition of jobbing pro even in his prime, is still being talked about five years later. Um, he, uh, Jeff Hendrick, James McLean, Shane Long still hanging around. Jamie McGrath, anyone? Ryan Manning, Ronan Curtis, James Connells. His point is that nobody knows who these players are yeah. and Kenny has to deal with. And when you look at the midfield... Now, in, in, in fairness to Jamie McGrath, I think he scored about 17 goals from midfield in the SPL last year. But I do take his wider point. Ten penalties, yeah, and I knew, I knew you'd I knew you'd come in with ten penalties. Yeah, yeah, but he's and he played him as his number ten at Dundalk, and uh, he's he taught when he picked him in the summer. He brought him in because this guy could be a, a number ten for us and all that. But then he didn't didn't play him enough. No, didn't no. Run the game, so he's not. No, uh, there is talk of him if he gets a move out of Saint Mirren for what he's doing. Um, I think like he's he's on that. He, he gets a lot of hiding playing for that team when you play against the big Scottish teams. So. It's a, it's a great move for him and he's doing well, but uh, I don't think we're going to see him in Faro on Wednesday. No. Um, we're going to see him in the other games either. Um, it's very difficult what he's going to do. But um, yeah, Paul Rowan is um, in the Sunday Times. But yeah, so Tommy Conlon is is cutting and it's um typically well-written piece by Tommy. Um, Paul Rowan's a bit more interesting. He's half uh, lauding uh, Kenny for the way he's done a two-week blitz to make sure he's at games and you saw the picture on he actually sent a picture on social media of him chatting pitch side with Shane Duffy after he scored that bullet header and Aaron Connolly who really needs to come through at some stage for Ireland um, so he's like unlike Trapp and Martin O'Neill's like like core to say the least efforts to attend club games you're basically made to it Kenny's is like a tour de force um, but he also he also is quite 
quite Kenny has to produce, has to pull this squad together to produce three performances. And what's really more important is probably the Azerbaijan for him keeping his job, Azerbaijan and Serbia games. Yeah. And, and he brings up the, the thing he goes, he puts the Luxembourg game down to they went for broke in Serbia back in March and they were jaded. And that's what happened. That's why Luxembourg came and won that game. So uh, he's in one say he's saying he, he's in fearing that he's not up to the job. In the other, he's saying he's doing all the work that you want from someone who's managing this job. So um, everyone's kind of, I suppose, sitting on the fence, hoping that he uh, did, did almost you- that he hoping vibes because he's the per- he's doing the kind of work that we've been screaming about for years to do with Irish players and he, he's an encyclopedic knowledge of them all he's coached so many of them you know either in League of Ireland or at under 21's level and uh, he just needs a break uh, in the next in the next week yeah um, he, he really does did you did you watch the Gary he's not going to get one though Joe if you know what I mean I just don't think he's going to get the look that he, he yeah. like when the Robinson thing went down I went oh okay he's just not going to get any look in this job um, maybe the, counter, the counterpoint, sorry, lads. I think to the to the <laughs> to the Tommy Conlon piece, or maybe underlying the points that Tommy Conlon makes is the flashback piece that Philip Quinn has in the mail, where um, he talks about the game that Ireland played against Portugal in two thousand, and of the eleven players and three subs, so of the fourteen players that played for Ireland that day, nine of them were with Premier League clubs. So okay, twenty one years ago. 2000 in my head doesn't seem that long ago, but that that's kind of underlying and the point that, that Tommy Connell makes in the Sunday in though, that, you know, what Mick McCarthy was bringing to Portugal in, in 2000 is very different to what Stephen Kenny has taken with him this week. Very much so. There's only two, Seamus Coleman and Shane Duffy, and Shane Duffy are the only two Premier League starting players that be in the, in the team. Jeff Hendricks in and out of Newcastle and the rest is championship. The, the two... The two, players, the two great hopes for this Irish team were Gavin Bazunu and Troy Parrott, who was excellent again for MK Dons. But they're playing third-tier English football because they're out on loan from Man City and Spurs. Bazunu will probably be a starting goalkeeper because Bebe Keller is sitting on the bench at Liverpool. We go on about this forever, and every time you just come back with it, it's either guys playing at a really low level, mm. very like Daryl Shea's having a great season in Championship for West Brom, but or they're they're just about just about on, on getting a playing reserve football in the Premier League. Yeah. Like he's Arthur is his experienced guy. And Harry Arthur uh can't get it has to play reserve football to get some minutes under his belt for Nottingham Forest under Andy Reid's under 23s. He's 31 years old. Uh, and that's Chris Hewton's team there and they're under pressure, but they're they're not looking they've no experience in their team and they're not looking to a 31 year old Irish international to fix it. But but Kenny has gone with him and brought him in and is hoping that they somehow do a job for them this week. The um, thrust, it seems, of some of the questioning in the press conference to Kenny was, well, are you going to rest certain players for this Portugal game? And so you're fresh for the other two. And he said he's not going to do that. Um, It's a big challenge. We mustn't be daunted. We have to be positive in our approach. You can't go there and defend for 90 minutes. I mean, it's the way he talks and, you know, so many of the things he does around the job would give you huge confidence, but it just hasn't happened really in the 13 games thus far. Like Tommy's um, piece, it's about damning, but also... You know, it's 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 basically Kenny doesn't have the players. You know, it's not so much Damien or Kenny. I mean, he says five of the twenty five are in the third division of English football. He says of you know the kind of floating casual sports fan now in Ireland that they wouldn't have a clue as to which clubs a lot of these players represent. They wouldn't be able to name many of them. There's not even one star personality that they can hang their hats on. The constant mediocrity on the pitch has begotten anonymity off it. And he I says, with, do you, yeah? <clears throat> I disagree with Tommy on that. Just, of course, there's no to hang the hat on, but the floating fan never knows what clubs people play for anyway, you know? And the floating fan always comes and goes. So they'll come back, like, you know, they'll they'll get into it if uh, yeah. six points out of the next three games. They have no shame. They'll rush back. Of course they will, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, they're the lads who, um, who come steaming in every summer for the dubs. Like um, he, he, he does say, um, look, Ronaldo, 180th cap in Pharaoh, looking for that 110th record goal. He does um, make the point, it could therefore get very ugly for Ireland on Wednesday. Very ugly indeed. One hopes they'll remember well, to tackle five Ronaldo. defenders and probably two holding midfielders, you know. That'll, uh, he, Kenny's, he, he was asked about, he goes, I, I've played against big European opposition as manager Dundalk and I've never, ever park the bus we always play a certain way you have to attack to, to defend against great teams and yeah so we did all that so he was very um as in he, he was asked a question about how, how it's going to go and i don't he doesn't have a choice he doesn't have an option of resting players for the next two games anyway no but he asked how it was going to go and he has he normally hesitates and takes a lot of time to think about answers 
but he hesitated for an age when he was asked how you think it's going to go and he just gave he was bullish and he goes you know we're, we're going to put in a performance we're going to do something here but he's been given lads that there's a bit of there is quality in the squad but a lot of the quality in, is just not playing football so you know there's a Reputations are as low as they've ever been, I imagine. I think in a general point as well, we get very hung up about the status of our players, you know, because we like to remember the days when, you know, there was a couple of players at Liverpool and four players at Aston Villa when they were a strong force in the old Division 1. But to me, uh, sort of casually observing it, the biggest impediment to Kenny so far is that he just, you know, like he's not going to have that quality of player that we would like him to have. That's 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 very obvious. But the thing that has held him back is that he couldn't even pick a consistent selection in the games that he has played. Because what he needs is a bit of stability. He wants to build a team. He wants that, you know, he has a very defined way of playing in his head. And, you know, like what you need there is repetition. And in international football, you get very, very little amount of it. You get very little exposure to the players and the players get very limited game time and preparation time together. Um, so to my mind, you know, you know, the horror show of some of the results, they were all underpinned by the number of withdrawals and the issues over COVID and everything else. And, you know, he, like what Ireland have now is what they need, a manager with a long-term vision in mind. It's not a case of, you know, what sort of team and what kind of tactics can we apply to get three points here, you know, like like patch it all up together and try and knock a tune out of it. He has an idea of where he needs to go. We have to get over the fact, I think, that he doesn't have the talent but I think in analysing what he has done to now and what he will do over the next however long, I think the biggest thing to bear in mind is the consistency of selection and the consistency of the makeup of his team because, you know, that to me is what will define whether they improve or the results kind of stay where they are. Well, when you say however long, so Paul Rowan says uh, victories over Azerbaijan and Serbia. So it's, uh, what is it, Portugal Wednesday, Azerbaijan on the Saturday and then Serbia the following Tuesday. Victories over Azerbaijan and Serbia could be enough to win Kenny the new contract he so desperately wants from an association which has traditionally given its managers time with the notable exception of Brian Kerr. So I guess that's what he's playing for a little bit at the moment, Gav, is to buy himself time, buy himself another contract, buy himself a shot at the Euros, which are very attainable, especially with a team where some of the more promising players will be at a much better age. And I suppose that's why the next week is so crucial. As uh, Paul Rowan says, go, to, go out to Pharaoh, lose the game, don't, you know, ship five. And then if you win against Serbia, win against Azerbaijan, home crowd for the first time, that might be enough just to get things moving a little bit for him because realistically this campaign's gone. I mean, he can't say that, but we can. And so it's about now him securing a contract for the Euros, Gav. That's where he's at. Ooh, I think we lost Gav. Connor, you can pick up that point. Yeah, no, I think that's probably bang on. I, I would imagine if you, um, if you presented Ireland's results, like how many games has Kenny played now at this stage? You know, Thir if you present, 13, 13, 13, one if you win. Present, yeah, if you presented those results um, and the score lines and a video of the performances to Kenny when he took the job, I'm not sure he would necessarily expect to still be in the job. Or certainly, I think he would accept that he is under pressure. But, you know, as I was kind of saying, an awful lot of what he was trying to do, build a team, implement a style of play, it was so badly affected by the number of withdrawals and players being called up last minute and not training. And then players would have to be pulled from the team just before the starting lineup because of COVID situation. So like it, you know, he took the team really at the worst possible time, you know, it, just because it was the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, like getting the next contract is key because I suppose the point that I'm making there is that, um, you know, the results to now have been completely influenced by the situation and i think what he needs now is more time whether he deserves it or not you know that i don't know really um but i think he will a lot of the work that he would like to have gotten to done done until now he has been unable to do yeah. for those reasons gav you're back with this final um word on stephen kenny i was just saying i don't know if you caught it i was saying uh, paul Rohn was making the point azerbaijan serbia win those two and you probably do enough to get yourself a contract and that's where you can really hope to kick on with the European campaign. I'd be doing really well if they beat Serbia, you know. Um, but if he hasn't got what how he wants them to play and how he wants them to be flexible, he wants them to play different systems and evolve and adapt on the pitch and all that. And he has to, as Connor's to Connor's point, the fact that he can say with Gavin Bazunu and he looks like he's gonna he's Shane Duffy thing is a huge fill up. He, so he's got a back about defense there now that he's that's gonna be consistent and 
John Egan will probably be in there as well. If there's three, they can play three centre backs. So, but it just gets pretty grim as it goes out the field. Although Troy Parrott has been, if you've been watching AK, MK Dons, Troy Barrett's been excellent. I um, ha- I haven't been watching too much MK Dons, but I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know he's I'm, been I'm he's been really goals. good. I've seen the goals. So um, that'll come in, but um, yeah, four points. Four points would, would get them into October and get them to November and they beat Luxembourg away. Yeah. Give against Portugal, finish third in the group is fourth even. It's it's just just limp into the European qualifying campaign where Kenny knows that there will be a lot of players playing a good le- good consistently a championship level in the next year or two, you know, maybe one or two more in the Premier League. Mm. Um, but he just needs time. Unfortunately, I, I don't think he has it. But um uh, there's a lot of there's, a, there's more goodwill anyway certainly than when if you remember back to the days of Brian Kerr when the knives were out very quickly there's more goodwill for this homegrown coach than there, there is and I, I think John Delaney and Kerr there were issues there as well um, which right. is part of it so we're beating Luxembourg away Gav are we okay interesting fair enough but it's the last the, game of the group the, arro- um, the arrogance uh, November 15th yeah I presumed I wanted to do something in that game yeah uh Eamon Sweeney, hold the back page, Sunday Independent. A champion to change our minds. This is Ellen Keane, who uh, won gold on Thursday morning, 26 years of age. No stranger to this show. She's presented here numerous at times. Um, competed in Beijing when she was just 13 and now has uh, fought through to finally win gold at the age of 26. And Eamon Sweeney really is just writing what a brilliant ambassador she is for the Paralympic Games and how, you know, she um, puts the athletes and their disabilities to the fore, doesn't try and shy away from realities. Um, so Eamon Sweeney says, some media articles before the London Games urged people to concentrate on the performances and forget about the disabilities altogether. But Keane's struggles with the arm she used to hide out of self-consciousness are part of her story. And uh, she's been a champion for that cause. He says of the Paralympic Games generally that uh, the Games upend received ideas about what people with disabilities are capable of. It gives centre stage to the kind of bodies which are sidelined by a mass media obsessed with the ideal images of health and beauty. And it challenges complacent ideas about what normality actually is. And no sporting event is more truly diverse than the Paralympics. And at the very end, he says, so let's celebrate our latest gold medalist, not an Olympic gold medalist, a Paralympic gold medalist one who deserves every bit as much praise and celebration as the winners at the other games in Tokyo. This is a champion to not just win hearts, but to change minds. And uh, I mean, there were amazing scenes as well from the house in Clontarf on uh, Thursday morning, her family and her parents in particular and her dog uh, watching. And uh, I think it's right that Ellen Keane is getting coverage uh, today. Connor. maybe could have got a bit more, I would have thought, given what she achieved and, and the career she's had. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, my kind of my eyes were opened by this piece. Um, even the 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 post that Ellen Keane put on her Instagram in February, where she said, I, I'm a Paralympian, not an Olympian. The Paralympian movement uses sport to showcase how powerful, how strong, and how great a person with a disability is if you give them an opportunity. I represent people with disabilities, not just my country. And I have to say, um, I, I've watched, I, I think the RT coverage of the Paralympics has been brilliant. Um, I was, you know, watching some of the competitions as they come on the television, just like you would any other. But watching the evening highlights package um, has been really, really interesting because um, they were showing some of the, the, the track cycling um, the other day. And I, I was just sort of tuned in out of, out of interest. And like, I, you know, wouldn't watch track cycling generally anyway. But Mark Rohan was on and he was really, really interesting in talking about the race and why um, one of the cyclists started poorly or finished well, maybe vice versa. And it had got to do with their physical impairment and why on that side of their body, um, you know, you, you can build up pace or you can lose it quicker. Um, and it was really, really interesting because it added a dimension to the analysis and the coverage of the sport. You know, it wasn't just a case of... Um, you know, this person is trying to start off quickly and, and finish, you know, the tactics that were employed. It was how the physical impairment had actually influenced their tactics over the course of the race. Um, and that's kind of something that I wouldn't have really considered a huge amount in the past, you know, when you watch the Paralympics. And it's a, it's a huge, to my mind anyway, and I might be wrong, but to my, it, it, it's a huge sort of step um, for the Paralympic movement to take because it wasn't so long ago that, you know, the Paralympics was just one of these kind of, um, the analysis of analysis, a lot of the analysis around it was, um, it's, it's a celebration of 
the great achievements that people who have physical impairments can can do. But now the sports themselves are being kind of analyzed on their own merits. Um, you know, with the kind of uh with the elements brought into it, as Ellen Kane outlined here, um, about the physical impairments that the that the various athletes have. Um so I, I you know the it, 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 it's, it's really, really interesting. And I think the way that it has been covered on Irish television um, has been top class. Cav? Yeah, I just echo everything you said there. It was, <clears throat> I thought it was a lovely line that she, well, uh, Eamon just quotes her directly. Uh, whether you have one leg missing or you're in a wheelchair or you're blind, you can literally do anything you want to do. There's always a way of doing something. I just thought that was lovely. Yeah. Um, the clock is coming against us. Just to, um, we were going to touch briefly on a couple of other pieces, like there was Ravel Morrison in the Sunday Times interview. If you're a United fan, you remember him being talked about as one of the real promising potential greats. And he's uh, 28 years of age now. He's at Derby with uh, Wayne Rooney. So he's chatting there about a few regrets, but hoping still there might be time for him. Just um, there is there are lots of kind of limerick pieces on the back of last week. I guess it's the Sunday's first chance, the Sunday paper's first chance to kind of talk about maybe what Jamesy says is about the best performance, best team he's ever seen. Um, so that's there. And then uh, Matt Cooper on the back page of the Sunday Business Post is talking about money in the GA and sponsorship money. And so uh, the people in Limerick GA circles, he writes, are sensitive to the idea that JP McManus's money has bought success. It hasn't, he says, in itself, but it surely has to have helped. He's on to say, it's not quite clear how much money McManus gives Limerick GA indirectly as well as directly annually, although some estimates um, suggest it might not be far short of a million each year, although um, they may be greatly exaggerated, he says. Some estimates that it might not be far short of a million a year may be greatly exaggerated, is the uh, point he makes. The uh, Swiss resident with the 100 million house in rural Limerick, which he visits on a restricted number of days each year so as not to become tax resident in Ireland, has been putting his money into Limerick GA yeah, since 04, writes Matt. Uh, he started his formal relationship with a 5 million contribution to reduce debts incurred for the redevelopment of the Gaelic Rains in Limerick. That freed up a lot of money for other use. And then, of course, is the shirt sponsorship, which was initially sporting Limerick as a logo. And now it's uh, been removed, giving uh, what Matt Cooper says is here, a, a pristine traditional jersey in which to win the last two All-Irelands. It has been claimed the McManus money is actually less than what Dublin gets from AIG or Cork gets from Sports Direct, although it should be noted the Limerick uh, population is smaller and therefore the money goes uh, further. And he adds the Limerick County Board still has to raise money elsewhere through raffles and fundraising draws from the uh, public. Um, Gav, you had sort of mentioned this is one worth touching on. What what jumped out to you about it or what was the interest here? Well, look, first of all, Limerick, it's, it's being successful in sports nowadays and hot in elite sport is about being organised. That's what it is. And I think Emmett Malone wrote a piece there a couple of months ago where he was saying that um, imagine Dennis O'Brien didn't put all that money into the FAI to pay for managers. Imagine he put it into academies, League of Ireland academies, knowing Brexit was coming down the line to have the infrastructure here to look after all these teenagers how much more it would have been better spent. Well, JP McManus has done that, you know, for 10 years now, they've been the best organized, uh, arguably better than even in the dubs, because you look at the 24 year olds they have now that they got hold of when they were 13 and 14 and the academy systems, which costs a lot of money that they put in in the scholarship systems. So hats off to them, congratulations to, to Limerick and to JP McManus for what they've achieved. But also when you look after an All-Ireland final onto a pitch, you look onto a pitch after a Super Bowl, you look onto a pitch after any major tournament, the only people on the pitch are the players, the coaches and the owner. <laughs> but in GA sense, it's the players, the coaches and the sponsor. Um, so, you know, it's 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 just the way it is now, you know, but it's 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 not streamlined and it's not you don't need a billionaire, as Leinster Rugby proved, you just need about four or five millionaires and you can get organized mm. and you can you can put systems in place to be and Munster Rugby are, have learned very slowly from it and are catching up now with by getting the right people, investors who are like JP McManus, who love their Limerick curling or who love their whatever it is. Everyone, like football clubs in Ireland, are going to need it now. It is, unfortunately, the business model for how you be successful in Irish sport at the very high end, how you compete on a global scale. You get get, a, get someone to come in and, and win. Yeah invest over a long period of time. And it has to be someone who loves what they're doing, loves it. It can't be for profit. I so uh, can that model last forever? You know, can, can this be the way we, we just continue, move on and have be sporting? That's it. That's how we are elite sports. now. we need that. We need that behind us, a bunch of millionaires or one billionaire just to, um, just to drive it all through because without them, is it possible? 
Well, oh, no. w- without him, and, and Matt Cooper is a side piece, you have to go down the grubby uh, role of uh, taking sponsorship money where you can get it. So he has another piece here, a Sports Direct question. The um, Cork situation, sponsored by Sports Direct since 2020. And um, Matt Cooper writes here, there were two main objections to the arrangement. One, controversy over the treatment of staff in Sports Direct in Britain in relation to issue- issues such as zero hours contract. And two the impact of exclusivity in the sale of Cork jerseys that it would have on smaller local retailers. And uh, the Cork County Board uh, head of uh, marketing, or Kevin O'Donovan, head of the County Board um, last weekend, came out fighting on various fronts. He was like, if we partnered with Apple, imagine what people would be saying about tax breaks. I I could go through a lot of partners with other counties that might have issues. So no... It didn't surprise me, the criticism that is, but I do think when it's Cork GEA, there's a special glee and some people want to dance in our grave on any particular issue. I wonder if Sports Direct had sponsored any or most of the other 32 counties, would it have made headline news? Would it, Connor? Uh, I know it would. I think this is the issue that Sports Direct are one of these companies that, um, because of what we know about Mike Ashley and because of the the visibility of Ashley during his chairmanship or his ownership of Newcastle, um, there's a sort of a particular distaste. But I would agree with him along the lines of, like, how far do you need to go down into some of the biggest sponsorship deals um, in Irish sport to find, you know, things that we might consider morally objectionable? Like, how many big teams or big competitions are sponsored by major financial corporations or banks and you know all the wreckage and ruination that they have done to the country over the last 15 years so you know i think that's the point here there's a reason why companies um sponsor sports teams and it's because it's a very wholesome association to have there's a reason that you know ga teams aren't sponsored by vincent de paul and greenpeace and it's because they don't need the publicity whereas companies like sports direct clearly do they're not in it for the good of their health and they're not in it because mike ashley has a very um has a very direct interest in seeing Patrick Gorgon win an All Ireland medal, you know, like that's that's the nature of, of sponsorship. And and you know, like the GAA for years were were pilloried over the sponsorship of Guinness for the All Ireland Hurling Championship, um, and it was seen as being you know a, a a slight on the Grab All Association as it was put. But like Guinness sponsored the Rugby Internationals, and there's not a word said to people. So there is an element, I think, of um, Cork being singled out here just because of the sort of distasteful image that Sports Direct have. But also that I think in the GAA, because we feel that we have ownership of the teams or the counties or the clubs, that they should be held to, to higher standards when it comes to ethics. Yeah, I, I think it's the highest. I, I do think the GAA, Gav, get hit with um, higher standards when it comes to their sponsorship, all right, because of the amateur ethos, because there isn't a huge wage bill, because it's so uh, wrapped up in the community. There's definitely a higher standard, I think, when it comes to GAA. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but uh, we're, we're going in one direction here at the moment. Like, oh, we've been talking about is Man City and Paris Saint-Germain and how they can buy anyone. And um, that, like, you know where you're in trouble when US sports is the ethical beacon, uh, a draft and a salary cap. And that's what that's what sport that we watch and cover on a massive scale has become. Um, like Tom Brady and LeBron James get complimented for taking 15 million off their salaries so they can actually get a tight end to protect them and a center, you know what I mean? So they can sign a bunch of old vets for 1.6 million and they they become the oh well look, isn't that a great thing that you've done? So yeah, that's that's where we're at now. It's um Ireland have to compete. We have to use everything we have and we've been using our um our wealthy individuals for a long time now. Um the sports directing, I think they're playing they're just talking Mike Ashley been stepping down as CEO. I've been reading reports about that in the was so their sports director trying to kind of change their image and like the thing is, once the money's coming in, you, you know, you take the hit in the media for a while, you can ride it out, and then the money's still coming in. So, you know, the big thing I find as well when it comes to GAA, and just to go back to the McManus thing, it's because there's so little um, sort of public knowledge as to the precise sums that are going into it and what it is that it effectively does. So, you know, if you're successful and you do have a wealthy benefactor, um, and people say that the reason that you won is because of the money, you're going to have to take that on the chin because, you know, unless the county board actually come out and say, well, JP, like the only insight that we got really into what JP Manus has done um, was when Shane Lowry signed that deal recently with Offaly GAA and he said that he spoke to McManus 
and McManus's advice to him was to get involved in the grassroots. And, and like that is the most sustainable way to get involved, you know, like the Limerick um, Hurling Academy is a huge driver for the success that Limerick has had now at senior level. It is a single geographical space where all the Limerick underage teams train. You know, they are all there. They're all interconnected. They are all subject to the same athletic development. I think there might be a sort of a sports psychologist or performance coach employed who they all see. They're all being coached in the same way to play the same style. And eventually that's just going to filter out on the top. And after that, what McManus puts into the senior teams, well, you know, that's that's another thing. But it, but I suppose, like, I did a piece with Mick Bahan, the Dublin ladies manager, topically enough, um, but it was back in it was back in February earlier on this year about how much money, because I'm sort of, a, you know, interested in what all the money gets kind of spent on. And, like, Mick said that he ran the Dublin ladies team last year for 75000 uh, for the year. Now, if you were going to... Um, Compare that to men. In 2017, Kevin McStay revealed that it cost 15,000 a week to run the Roscommon senior men's footballers. So, it, you know, over the course of an eight month season, that adds up to around half a million euro. So, again, like, <laughs> there's no end to the amount of money that you can kind of spend funding an inter county team. Um, you know, it depends on how many voluntary coaches and people who help out that you have versus the sort of highly specialized coaches that you employ to come in. That's all a very, I wouldn't say a murky area in the GAA, but we don't know for definite how many people various different county teams employ. Um, but I suppose the underlying point of all of this is whatever people want to say about McManus's money, initially he spent it exactly in the right way, which is to, um, to go after the underage structures because the Limerick thing now looks very sustainable. Um, you know, they have a very defined style of play their hurlers are absolutely immaculately put together. And, um, you know, that's a much better way, I would imagine, to spend money than simply giving a slush fund to an inter-county manager to come in and trying to inflate the thing very quickly. Because no matter how big you inflate it, um, you know, that bubble eventually is going to burst. And ultimately, it's not like you can buy in other players. You can't buy in, um, you, know, you can't make transfers. So I think it's a bit more palatable. Ultimately, once the money's been spent reasonably well, you know, it's not... But it, it's not like they can buy in 10 players and pick off the weaker counties. Uh, fellas, we are out of time. That was great. Thanks so much for Thanks giving up your time. Great to have you with us. Gavin Comiskey of the Irish Times, Conor McKeown of the Irish Independent. Much obliged. That was the paper review on podcast and uh, back next week. Thanks, fellas. Bye. Cheers. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball.